of the of the of the um, of the set of the indices uh, with the natural partial order uh, which comes from the from the inclusion okay and using this notation <clears throat> we can look at the somewhat uh, more complicated picture so we take the hypercube of uh, dimension four we label its uh, its vertices the way that uh, that i did in the previous case however here this is a, a bit more complicated and we have the natural diagram which uh, presents the um, which presents the the inclusion but all the way if i take the the action of the c star on the product which is of which is diagonal then actually these arrows here are the short orbits so there are the edges uh, on this hypercube there are the lines uh, with respect to the standard uh, product polarization of this product of p1s but there are also the orbits of this diagonal action okay and now uh, what would be the generalization of our picture of this three-dimensional hypercube so here uh, we have um, sections. So the section of the uh, partial order set will be a division into two subsets uh, so that uh, the obvious uh, relation induced between each of these um, uh, elements in the subset is preserved. So these are particular section so here one is in yellow the other is i think that the color is called lime uh, but of course you have many more sections than that but i choose those actually the reason is that in two slides i will compare this with a more uh, well less general or more general it depends on your point of view a theory of the git and if you think about this hypercube and the height function determined by the say by the number of the elements in the subset then as you see these sections divide the subsets of the uh, uh, cardinality one from the uh, one or, or zero from the subset of the bigger cardinality etc right and this is uh, another uh, notion here you have a semi section so a semi section is a division into three uh, three subsets so you have in between you have the set which is also uh, uh, sets of elements in this in this uh, uh, set which is in agreement with this relation which is over here Okay, so uh, here I introduce the notion of the sections and semi sections, which is actually the language which was used by Biawinitsky to generalize the uh, 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 GIT theorem for uh, ge geometric um, invariant theorem. Uh, but let's for now let's concentrate on the picture which we will get by taking the sections of this of this hypercube uh, well by the hyperplanes which are here uh, determined by the appropriate uh, levels in this the scheme of the subsets of the four dimensional set so uh, here i just wrote a cube of reference uh, which has the uh, the edges labeled by some some of these subsets as you see there are, <clears throat> there are the cardinality one subset and the cardinality three subsets and the first semi section uh, the one which was at the very uh, very top <clears throat> except the single point so it was the semi section which went through the cardinality one uh, points and you have uh, the other semi section which goes through the uh, through the cardinality three points in between you have this uh, i avoided uh, writing the um, the other labeling since this is the just the schematic picture so we have the semi section which goes uh, through the six points of cardinality two okay so uh, that's what you see uh, on the pure picture of the sections of the hypercube but you can imagine that here 
you have a pretty clear representation of how these objects look like from the point of view of toric geometry. So if you think about the, the, the hypercube as representing the product of P1, then you have a number of uh, toric, three-dimensional toric varieties, which are associated to these sections. Uh, in addition, uh, semi-sections, sorry. Here, uh, I, in, in, in green, I present one of those true sections, so the division of the set of the vertices of the, uh, of the hypercube and the, uh, to, uh, to subset, right? So uh, if you look at this picture, then you will definitely see that this one was obtained by cutting out the, uh, the vertices in this red cube. Uh, by hyperplane, so in, in, in terms of the toric geometry, this uh, section is associated to the blow up of the four points of this, uh, of this P3, okay? Good, so these are a nice picture. Let's try to put uh, some order in, 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 this, in this discussion, right? So uh, uh, from the point of view of the Marfo uh, GIT, what we are doing here, we uh, choose an ample line bundle on the product of the, actually in this particular case of P1s, and we change the linearization. So in this particular instance, since we had this height function uh, which was associated to the number of the vertices, it's not hard to guess that actually we choose a, a product of O of ones or, or rather product of the fullbacks of O ones on this, on this product as our polarization. And actually our, uh, uh, our linearization will define the uh, choice of the orbits uh, which will eventually uh, become uh, parameterized by the quotient in the terms of the GAT. From the point of view of this diagram, right? So this is just the schematic view. From the point of view of this diagram, the important thing is where, uh, where the, uh, the position of the fixed point set components. So here, uh, as in the case of this four-dimensional hypercube, uh, you see that between uh, the source and the sink, you have a number of the fixed point position, and then the choice of the polarization or the choice of the section of these orbits will determine the, the quotient. So the quotient, <clears throat> as, we, uh, as we realized by looking at these hyperplane sections of this hypercube, are near the source, which is P3, near the sink, which is also P3. And in between you have uh, those two guys were just the blow ups of the, uh, this P3s in the two points. Now, uh, the whole picture was meant to give an illustration on uh, how uh, to use the sister action to, uh, <clears throat> to understand the birational geometry. So the classical idea is that to start <clears throat> with a huge object, you take different portions, the different portions parameterize the set of orbits, and the uh, difference between these uh, consecutive quotients depending on the linearization or the choice of the sections which uh, which in some sense better describe these phenomena uh, are some uh, elementary uh, birational uh, transformation between these objects. So the first one was just the blow up of the four points. The last one was the blow down of the, of the uh, uh, four devices to the four points of this P3. However, in between these two different um, these two different uh, intermediate varieties, which were obtained by these blow, blow ups, uh, differ by elementary operation of slope. I will come back to this just in a moment in more detail. What I want to stress at this particular <coughs> moment is that um, uh, from my point of view, this uh, 
relation, uh, uh, I mean, Białyński's way of thinking uh, about the quotients as the choice of sections of orbits and the position of the section with respect to the, to the fixed point components is uh, more intuitive uh, than somewhat more formal and depending on the projective um, assumption choice of the polarization of an ample uh, line bundle. So uh, what I will like to cultivate in this talk is this way of observing the consecutive quotient, GIT quotients in terms of the position of this section in the language of Białyński with respect to the, uh, uh, to the position or the choice uh, of the uh, fixed points. Of course, these fixed points have to obey the order which is, uh, uh, which is implied by the action. So are there any questions at this point, maybe? Okay, so that, that was just the, the very general introduction. Uh, now, uh, let's pass to the application of this way of thinking, uh, which is uh, due to Morelli and Wodacic. So the concept is that given the birational map, so you have a birational map, uh, you should associate to this. So uh, Morelli was the toric case and Wodacic was the, the general case. So the, the concept was as follows. If you start with a, uh, with a, uh, with a birational map, uh, you may try to, or actually they construct a semi-projective variety, which is of dimension one bigger, which admits uh, C star action. And, and I'm using the words of Wodacic, uh, inside you have two open subsets. Uh, one uh, subset consists of those points where the limits at zero don't exist, and the other consists of points where limited infinity don't, do not exist. I mean, that's the way uh, <clears throat> uh, Wodacic prefers to think because his interest is rather to think about those two particular quotients. So in the language of the, if the variety X twisted X, I mean the calligraphic X was projective. These are the orbits which at zero converge to the source. And these are the orbits, I mean this, the geometric place of orbits, uh, which uh, converge to infinity at infinity, okay? Uh, and uh, the approach of Wodacic is uh, to think about the birational map in terms of the sister action. So uh, these two sets represent uh, the initial uh, varieties, uh, but as quotients uh, mm, of this X uh, twisted, okay? Quotient defined over these two open subsets. So the set of orbits are actually represented by these by these varieties. So the construction of this uh, quasi-projective variety is, well, I would say a bit tricky. So I, of course, I skip it since uh, I promised that the uh, that the talk will be non-technical. Uh, the important thing is that in the language of uh, BBC decomposition, uh, I mean not BB BB cell. The, the composition. <laughs> uh, uh, these, uh, the, these, the closures of these two sets in terms of a variety, if the variety X uh, twisted was compact, were uh, two extremal cell cells in terms of this decomposition. I will not introduce the decomposition, but I guess most of the, of the participants know what I mean, okay? And uh, uh, the major uh, achievement here is that after you construct this, uh, uh, this variety with the C star action, you, you can actually make it smooth by taking equivalent resolution. And this, in fact, was uh, used by Wodacic to prove the factorization theorem. 
So here is the statement of the uh, factorization theorem. So given a birational map of two smooth uh, projective varieties, there is a factorization in the sense that there is a sequence of blow-ups and blow-downs. Perhaps some of these are just identities. So you can do two consecutive blow-ups if you want, just taking one of these diagonal maps to be identity. Uh, which factors this, okay? And uh, the idea of the proof actually goes to this Kobodis uh, construction. Namely, if you look at the, at the picture of this big variety, then each of these uh, uh, sections and each of these elementary uh, 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 two, what should I say? How should I say? Uh, two consecutive uh, different uh, quotients in our uh, sections uh, can be resolved in terms of these blowups. Let's do do the schematic picture of this. Okay, so here is the <clears throat> what happens. We have one um, uh, in a fixed point. So we have some uh, orbits which converge to this inner point at infinity and uh, some orbits which diverge from this, uh, from this fixed point. And of course we have general sections. Then if uh, we, I mean, we have general orbits which are usually orange. And stuff, okay, so uh, now <clears throat> uh, we have two sections which are associated to uh, uh, GIT quotients. Actually, the quotient in the middle also is well defined, but usually it's much worse. It has a bad singular point. So you have two uh, <clears throat> two varieties which say parameterize uh, parameterize orbit in a nice way, and both uh, via the um, uh, either inclusion of these sets over which this quotient is defined. Or here, as you see, by taking the limit points of respective orbits, uh, both of these uh, are mapped to this uh, quotient, which is associated to the semi-section, right? So here you have the, the picture of these quotients in terms of the sections. And here you have the relation between them, which uh, boils down to, uh, morphs from relatively good varieties uh, uh, with relatively good singularities to some bad singularity uh, at the cost of, uh, well, uh, having this uh, set over which this quotient uh, being bigger, right? So what is the idea of the elementary uh, I mean, elementary by rational operation is finding uh, the blow up. And this is actually technically done by, by Wodacic in terms of the weighted blow ups. But if you look at this blow up, I try to uh, make the picture at least schematically correct in the sense that, of course, over this orange uh, set, which parameters the ge general orbits, then all these objects are the same. Here you have the blue orbits, which are parameterized by this blue blue interval. You have this red orbits, which are parameterized by the red interval. This point is a bit bad point, but here instead of this bad point, we uh, uh, we actually uh, put something which is much bigger than both of these uh, blue blue and red sets. Namely, this is essentially said, said theoretically, this is a product of these two things. I mean, this a typical case is the Atiyah uh, quadratic singularity. So you resolve the quadratic singularity and you obtain just P1 cross P1. But what I want to stress here is that at this point, we have actually an object which parameterizes uh, not really the orbits, but uh, unions of orbits. Namely, let me stress how, how should you look at this picture 
well, let's put it in black, right? So if you take this particular point, then this parameterizes one orbit which converges and the other orbit which diverges. So in some sense, this object has also the meaning in terms of the of quotients, although it's not quotient in the in the GIT sense. And I will come back to this just in a moment. Uh, so uh, the uh, uh, the Vodacic proof of the uh, of the factorization theorem is essentially the uh, construction of the cobordis plus resolution of this elementary uh, birational transformations, which are somehow already nicely ordered by the by the cobordis. Okay, good. So how does it work in our in our particular case? Well, uh, here this is pretty uh, well. At least in dimension three, you can describe it. So we had a, a number of the polytopes. We, we started with the with the tetrahedra, then we cut out from the tetrahedra. We cut out the uh, the vertices by slicing off a little te tetrahedra. Then if we cut out, and here here are these. Uh, rectangles that is you blow up the the lines the strip transforms of lines on this blow up of the p3 uh, you will obtain a resolution a, a variety which resolves uh, this uh, uh, not only the rational map uh, but also it resolves uh, all of the objects which are in between However, at this point, I would like to focus on the statement which is here on the slide. Namely, in general, <coughs> uh, this construction works also for arbitrary, <coughs> arbitrary uh, uh, Cremona transformation of this type, so the, the inversion of the ZIs. Uh, then uh, the toric variety, which is uh, which is called, uh, which is associated to a polytope. Uh, known as permutahedron uh, resolves this uh, birational morphs, which means that uh, um, mm, uh, that we have regular maps uh, which uh, uh, go to each of the of the ends of this of this um, of this classical Cremona uh, transformation here. What I would like to stress is that the vertices of this permutahedra are actually labeling uh, paths in the um, in this hypercube, so uh, ordered uh, uh, path along the edges, starting from the empty set, which was the source, and uh, ending and the sink, which was labeled by the uh, by the complete set zero of zero to n, right? So in some sense, the vertices uh, remember uh, the uh, the orbits uh, of this original action, the shortest orbits, and the paths on this uh, hypercube, which were which was obtained by the union of the orbits. And here I saw. This is the source sources Wikipedia, and the author is Tilman Peace. I uh, stole the picture of the permutahedron in dimension uh, three. So, <clears throat> and it's, as it turns out, there are, uh, uh, there are at least two different labelings. So, this is a bad lab labeling of, of the vertices. This is a good labeling of these vertices. Uh, what, what's the difference? Well, here in the good labeling, uh, you have uh, four hexagon. So the hexagon is all eventually what we will get after <coughs> cutting out uh, the vertices of the tetrahedron and then blowing up or cutting out the edges of these, uh, these squares over here. So the four of these start with the same number and four, like this one, end with the same number. Also, uh, here, uh, if you if you see the um, the colors of the edges of this tetrahedron, 
uh, I'm sorry, of this per, permutahedron, that actually they represent the same classes of curves uh, in uh, the resulting variety. For example, if you if you contract the red curves, then you will collapse it into one of these uh, of these blowups. Okay, so in particular, you have to uh, you have a description, combinatorial description, uh, and actual elementary geometric description of this res resolution of this uh, of this rational map in dimension three. Okay. Eric, can I ask a short question? Sure. Just to clarify, right. so this uh, hexagons basically correspond to dual path of surface of degree six, which maps to points. Yeah. Uh, yes, I mean you have the whole inductive structure on on these yeah. dice, right? I mean, which is essentially the sub choice of the of this inversion, right? So okay. Yeah. So okay, I'm I will not actually concentrate on of this. This is rather okay, a, okay. an example from which I would like now to well okay, but, but what I would like to stress here that we have the whole um, uh, network of these polytopes, which are, which are also associated to the to the quotients, right? So these were the uh, the quotients uh, say of the lowest levels. These were those which were obtained by blowing up these guys, right? That was the flip. This thing, oops, oops, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Okay, maybe I should. So that's the flop. These are the blow-ups. So uh, what you can see here is that this um, this permutahedron actually is not only the resolution of uh, of the original map. So the rational map was from here to here, but it also controls all the objects in between. So the whole thing is, I mean, that was the <laughs> very long introduction, but as I told you, this is the uh, just a, a talk, a propaganda talk. So now I will uh, pass to more concrete stuff, right? So uh, this permutahedron has, as I said, this universal property that it dominates all of the quotients, right? And this, in general, this is the property of the Kapranov's Cho quotient, right? So the permutahedron is actually the Kapranov's Cho quotient, so the universal object which uh, parameterizes not only the orbits, but parameterizes unions of the orbits. And uh, actually, up to normalization, you can identify with the, with the inverse limit of the system of the GIT quotients. Okay, So this is a very good candidate for the strong factorization conjecture. So what's the strong factorization conjecture? The factorization conjecture proved by Wodacic was about a sequence of blowups and blowdowns in whatever order. Uh, the strong factorization conjecture says that there is one object in between, which is obtained by consecutive blowups. So these guys here, these are blowups. These are blowups. And it dominates both sides. Uh, okay, so what about it? Well, it's not proof, it's still a conjecture. Uh, and uh, nevertheless, I would like to ask two questions regarding this conjecture. The first is, say, uh, more theoretical. Uh, as I said, this uh, suppose that we can really do the same trick as Vodacic did. That is, we uh, we take a birational map, we construct the cobordis or a complete variety, so bordis, uh, which has the quotients being these guys, and then uh, then we take the uh, Chow quotient. So the Chow quotient dominates these two guys, right? So at this point, I'm not really interested in the uh, in the point of the smoothness or the fact that these maps here are the blow-ups, 
but I'm, uh, I'm uh, section, I mean, consecutive blow ups, but I'm just trying to understand if this object should come like in the, in the Vodachi construction from the C star geometry of the somewhat uh, more general, I mean, a bigger object, this, this cohortus or bodies, which joins these two varieties. So here, uh, look, uh, the difference from the, mm, from, the, uh, from the previous approach is that actually uh, you don't really care about the two ends of this, uh, of this construction. So the two quotients which were associated to the sink and the source of this construction, but in between as a bonus perhaps, you may have a, a number of uh, intermediate quotients, some good quotients, the geometric quotients which were associated to the sections and some well uh, good but not so good quotients which were associated to the semi sections okay so that's the advantage of the of the of the uh, child quotient so this question is uh, uh, shouldn't one rather try not to <coughs> not to prove the uh, uh, the strong factorization conjecture, but rather look at the objects which have these properties, like the child quotient. And the question two, oops, sorry. Uh, the question two is the practical question. <laughs> what would be the use of this? Why should it be uh, interesting not to factor, uh, to find the strong factorization conjecture but to have this uh, this usage of the of the child. So let me start with answering the second one. Of course, the answer will be rather again a propaganda with some example. But okay. So what the Vodacic um, theorem is useful for? I mean, it's a great tool to prove that certain properties of the varieties are invariant with respect to of smooth varieties. I'm sorry. <coughs> Are invariant with respect to the uh, to the birational morphism. If you can prove that the property is preserved under the smooth blow up, blow down, then surely by the Vodacic theorem it is preserved by the birational <clears throat> by the birational map. Okay, that's nice. Uh, uh, however. In many situations, uh, we may really want somewhat which goes beyond this uh, general properties. So uh, in many situations, uh, we would like uh, to look at the, at the rational map. Uh, well, we can, of course, we can construct the diagonal. I mean, this is a, a proper variety. So suppose that we start with two projective varieties, we take the rational map, then we take the product, we closure uh, the graph of this map. And this is a very nice variety, perfect, right? But this is usually very singular, okay? So the point is that you would like to understand uh, what is actually the resolution of this object if you want to understand what this map uh, brings, I mean, like the numerical properties. And I will give an example to this. Uh, Oops, sorry. Okay, so the first example is a generalization of this very basic example of the Cremona transformation. So the Cremona map, which we discussed in the first part of the talk, was is actually the inversion of diagonal matrices. Okay, uh, this is a classical object, and of course, uh, he, here I gave some description of the resolution of this object in terms of the polytops. It's a very nice object because everything here is, I mean, given by monomials, so it's great, right? But uh, more generally, you may ask about the inversion of a bigger class of, of matrices, like inversion of all the set of the matrices, then you pass to the projectivization of these, right? And uh, you want to understand what this map is about. And this has some, uh, well, actually many, I think, 
uh, practical uh, applications because uh, uh, you want to understand, I mean, you take this inversion of matrices, you want to understand, for example, how the site also uh, actually, you, you may want to understand, suppose that you have um, a cycle Z which lives here, and you want to understand what is the, the image over here. You understand it as good uh, as you can tell uh, what is the nature of this variety. The, the information that this is just obtained by a sequence of the smooth blow-ups of this is too little. So you would like really to know what, uh, uh, what this resolution looks like, okay? And uh, here is the, um, uh, the observation. <coughs> Namely, in this particular instance, the construction of this cobordis is rather straightforward. If you remember how you inverse the, the matrices via the reduction to the echelon four, which is fortunately those of us who have to teach uh, first year students train it every year. I mean, you say you put, <laughs> if you have matrix N by N, then you put two blocks, right? This is the, your matrix. And this is the identity matrix. Then you do the echelon uh, uh, algorithm. If you, if, if you are lucky, that is if the matrix is invertible, you will get uh, on the left hand side, you will get the identity. On the right hand side, you will get the inverse of the matrix. Great, okay? But this means that the presentation of an element in the Grassmannian variety of this guy and this guy uh, is the same. That is, this is the same point in the Grassmann variety, right? So as in our original example of the, <coughs> of the, uh, of the Cremona transformation, if I multiply, say, uh, this part by T, where T is my coordinate. So, so I'm taking the action. Uh, I take the T on A I. This is T A I. So that's a very nice action. This is actually the action which we used for the diagonal matrices. So here, of course, you will obtain the map uh, by the same argument from the tangent space at the uh, at the uh, zero, uh, I'm sorry, one, zero i, right? I'm sorry, to the tangent map at the one, zero, okay? Right, but this means that the argument which we did for the, uh, for the case of the, um, of the permutahedron should somehow work here as well. They might be uh, technically more involved, but they should. So what you should start with, you should start with the, uh, with the, with the Grassmannian variety of this type. You should consider the action which I just raised, right? Then you should look at the fixed points of these. You should look at the orbits. Then you should look at the, uh, at the Chow quotient for this orbit. Okay, uh, right, but uh, here you have additional advantage. This is not the torrid variety as it was in, <coughs> in the case of the, um, of, the uh, of the permutahedron, so the diagonal matrices, but still you have the orthogonal group, uh, which is just the G, L, N by N, which acts on the respective left, uh, left, well, I think so, yes. I think it acts left, right, okay. You multiply it this way, <laughs> matrices. Uh, uh, and so your construction is actually invariant with respect to, to the action of this group. So in particular, uh, and this is one of the results which I want to, want to refer to, uh, um, for the application reason, the question regarding the inversion of symmetric matrices is, is very interesting. 
So in particular, uh, if you look at this picture here, this, this is the picture of the variety which parametrizes uh, orbits. This is the Chow quotient of the, uh, of the Lagrangian Grassmannian. Uh, and as you see, um, it looks very much like the hexagon which parameterized the diagonals, uh, except uh, that you have extra ports and the hexagon actually uh, was a cheap guy. Uh, well, it had only two edges and here at each point you have five edges because the actual the quotient will be of dimension five. And <coughs> the hexagon or the permutahedron was uh, had vertices which were parameterized by the parameterization uh, by the permutations. I'm sorry, were labeled by the permutations. Here you have flags, so the flags uh, in the case of the diagonal uh, matrices were of step one. Here we allow also the flags of step two. So the uh, vertices of this permutahedron are actually coming from the diagonal. Uh, but you have extra uh, points which are coming from the flags, uh, uh, which allow also of the step two. And here, actually, to describe this object, we use the fact that uh, the action of this orthogonal group on the space of orbits uh, is understandable. In the sense that if you would take the Cartan torus into the, inside this uh, this orthogonal group, so the group which permutes with the action of the C star, uh, <coughs> then we, we can understand what are the orbits which are fixed by this action. So there are actually there are the points of the Chow quotient, which are the unions of orbits which consist of lines and co conics on this on this. Uh, uh, on this Grassmann variety. Okay, so in particular, the bottom line is that using this method, using actually the information which comes from the Chow quotient, you can understand this variety. Because once you have the picture like this, this is the GKM graph, so Goreski, Kotfitz, McPherson, you can put the <coughs> machinery <coughs> of the K theory or maybe of the. Uh, equivalent case euro or equivalent cohomology, and you can understand a lot of things which regard this variety which resolves this rational map. And therefore you can understand this rational map. Okay, so that was an attempt to justify uh, the, or that was an attempt to answer the question two. So to justify why uh, using the Chow quotients of a board is associated to a, a map of uh, a rational map of varieties could be useful for particular applications. So that's the motivation. Now let's pass to question A. Uh, question one. Okay. So here I would like to note um, two things. The first one is a basic in the GIT theory. So uh, Marford says, uh, if you want to find a, a quotient, you should choose, uh, you should choose uh, an ample line bundle, and then you choose a linearization. So the linearization is, is the lift up of the action uh, on the variety to the total space of the line bundle. And then uh, you obtain a, a set, which you will call the set of semi-stable points, such that you have a regular morphism. This is an open set that, uh, to the projective spectrum of the set of sections, which are invariant with respect to this linearization. So this mu stands for the for the linearization. So if you think about the <coughs> And as some grading, so this is the uh, grade grade zero sections in this um, in this multiple of, of this multiples of the uh, ample line bundle. So that's the GIT, right? Uh, on the other hand, you have yet another 
abbreviation, three-letter abbreviation, like CIA, KGB. Uh, here you have the MDS. So MDS uh, stands for the Mori Dream, uh, Mori Dream Space. So the, that was the geometric invariant theory. And the Mori Dream Space is an idea of uh, looking at the uh, small two-factorial modifications so uh, the guys which are essentially isomorphic to the original variety in codimension one and uh, looking at them in terms of the linear systems so if whoops i'm sorry i didn't want to show it so far so if you um, if you take say uh, a variety which i would call x flat uh, which has good properties here i'm sweet I'm really not considering the technical stuff. Uh, then if you take a big line bundle, uh, so that you can produce a projective spectrum of the system of mul multiplicity of sections of the multiplicities of the big bundle, then the object for appropriate good choice of this of this line bundle will be actually uh, the SQM, so small Q factorial modification of the original one. So we will obtain a birational map, which will be actually isomorphism in codimension one, okay? So that's one three letter theory. That's another three letter theory. Let's put them together, okay? So let's start with the, uh, here I add this equalized. The equalized means that if you, in particular, it means that uh, the, the action on the tangent uh, points at the sink and the source have the weights plus minus one, which boils down to the fact that if you blow up the sink and the source, okay? So these are, these, these will be the parameterizing space actually for the beginning and the end orbits, right? So if you blow if you blow them up, then you will obtain the um, uh, the devices which are the fixed points of this action. Okay. So suppose that we have a nice action on a projective variety. We blow the sink and the source. And then we have a nice action uh, which has the sink and the source, which are divisors. Okay, so this is a very nice situation. This is <clears throat> what you would expect <coughs> to to get after the projective projective version of your cobordes. That's why sometimes we would call it just borders. Okay. Then uh, you have the sink and the source, which are the devices, which I call respectively E naught and infinity. Then uh, if you look at the general orbit, then you will notice that the sections invariant with respect to the linearization of the, of the line bundle can be actually understood as the sections which vanish with the degree which is here explicitly written at the sink and the degree which is explicitly written at the source. This just boils down to noticing that if you take, so this is your P1, right? This is not really P1 because th these are the sections of H0 of say O of M, right? Then if you choose the linearization so that this is the invariant part, so in particular, this means that the degree D uh, uh, binary forms are invariant with respect to this linearization, then these sections have actually the multiplicity, <clears throat> if this is M, then you can calculate the multiplicity over here and the multiplicity over here. So the multiplicity over here will be exactly M minus D, and here will be exactly D minus M, if, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, bo, 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 no, the other way around. I'm sorry. No. So here it will be multiplicity D, because these are the polynomials of degree D. And here will be the M minus D. Okay, now it's okay. Okay. So, uh, exactly this observation will tell you that you can really relate the left hand side to the right hand side. So you can relate the GIT to MDS. Question? Or oh, you are saying that I'm about to. 
to finish, right? But that's okay because I have my last slide. Last but one slide, okay? So this is how it works in practice, okay? So suppose that we have the, this is a simplified picture. So we assume that we take a variety which has the car number one. So I can draw the objects which I will draw just at the moment. And, and here I have the GIT quotients. I didn't put the names to simplify the picture, okay? So I have the rational maps from this X, which is of dimension say N plus one to the GIT quotients, GIT quotients, which are of dimension M, right? Okay, so now what I'm trying to say is that actually using the observation, which we did just a moment ago, uh, here are different linearizations of these quotients, okay? So the linearizations were also the sections. So these points here stand uh, uh, for both the linearization, but also to do, for the fixed point components, but also they mean some quotients which are associated to the sections which pass through the fixed point components, right? Okay. Uh, but our observation was that actually the linearization can be identified with the linear system, which uh, has certain multiplicities at the sink and the source. So if I blow this sink and the source, then what I will get, I will get the MDS, and this is under some assumptions, is already a theorem. Okay, so blowing up the sink and the source, I will obtain the MDS. And this thing over here is the big cone for this one. And this is the division into the chambers associated to the small Q factorial modification. So among the small Q factorial modification, for example, you have this chamber will describe a variety which <laughs> has a regular map onto the uh, quotient. So it will be either P1 bundle or P1 vibration, although this guy is definitely much more complicated, right? Okay, so which means that uh, looking at this variety with the C star action, you can complete it to a number of the its small Q factorial modification on which you will have C star action as well. And as the matter of fact, these guys have child quotients as well, okay? So the point is that using this construction, you can build up the whole pyramid, as you see, of the child quotient in which your child quotient for this guy will be the top. And actually, if you look, say, at the child quotient of the guy which sits here, or if you prefer here, if you, if you don't want to have bad singularity, so this is a small Q factorial modification, and the child quotient is located here. If you say, oops, 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 if you say, take the guy, so, which is represented by this chamber, then the child, child quotient will be this one. So looking at both the uh, GI thing and SQM theory, you can put uh, all, you can put all uh, objects into one picture, which means that uh, somehow, uh, not only uh, you have the, uh, construction of the child quotient for the variety that you start with, but you also understand the intermediate levels, which in our picture of the permutahedron were, ob were obtained by this uh, toric uh, modifications, which were easy to describe. And I know that I'm behind the time. So these are the two papers from which these results are taken. So if you really want to look into the technicalities, this is the this applied paper about <coughs> inversion of the of the of the matrices. So society of Ind industrial engineering. So it looks good. Uh, and this is a preprint uh, which is about this construction of SQMs and the relation with the with GIT. Okay, I'm done. Thank you. Thank you very much. Let's thank uh, Yarek uh, and in Zoom as well. Uh, like, uh, Am I supposed to? Okay.
thank you, <coughs> Yarek. <coughs> I was not uh, pushing you like to stop. No, no, I just well, but I I know that people appreciate when the talk is done in a way so that <laughs> it's never not too long, right? But if you have questions, then I will be very happy to to, uh, to answer, right? So. Yeah, uh, let's ask uh, people. Uh, anyone, uh, please ask a question to Yarek. Any questions, please ask in the chat or just uh, ask in person. Let me check the chat. chat. Uh, I think no one, no one asking. Uh, okay, so which means uh, that the talk was great because uh, everything was explained so. Clearly, that no no further questions. Uh, I, <clears throat> uh, I I don't have actually a direct question on uh, about about basically the main results, but for example, for this diagram, when you have this permutahedron, mm -hmm. yeah. If can, can you scroll down? If you share the screen. Uh, well, I have to share the screen, right? Okay. Uh, I think that's the one. Okay, sorry, I'm sloppy with this. It's okay, it's okay, it's okay. okay. If you just go back well, and, uh, for this picture of resolution of Cremona and this Bermuda hydron in the middle. Okay. So it's a bit uh, back. Farther back? I mean, yeah, 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 yeah. Just basically your inspiration in some sense. Yeah. Yes, but uh, the, see, the, the, <laughs> this picture. So in the middle, it's 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 a flop. Yeah, yeah, it's okay. But for example, if you look for the for this permutahedron, if you look for the hexagon sides, yeah, mm -hmm, you can mm -hmm. see that you can actually flop them. Yes, uh, did, did you meet this? Mean, Here, if you have the hexagon, right? Yeah. The, uh, not I think. Yeah, it looks like one. It looks like a hexagon. Uh, so uh, the hexagon uh, has two types of. So exactly. the hexagon is actually the P two blown up in two, three, three points. points. Yeah. Okay, so <coughs> exactly. So essentially, if you if you look at the at the uh, the maps which go down to the to the sink and to to, to the source then you have mm -hmm. the, the distinguished curves which you are uh, to contract first and then those which you are supposed to contract okay let me go back and let me go back because this yeah, one yeah. this one uh -huh. is better right? yeah. yeah 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 okay so this is the bad labeling this is good mm -hmm. labeling Okay, uh -huh. so if you if you look over here, right, this will get contracted to the vertex of the tetrahedron labeled yeah. by three. Okay, uh -huh. so here you have the two-step contraction. So the first step contraction, let me understand what, what should I do? I should contract the uh, the red stuff over here, uh -huh. and this is the blowout to the uh, to the p3 with uh, blow down to the p3 with three points blown down and then uh, you will contract the, the other guy right if you go if you if you if you look at this uh, at this hexagon then you will see that this uh, has the Two as the last digit, which means that this will be the contraction to the other, <coughs> to the other uh, P two. I see, I see, I see, I see. Uh -huh. But you see, the whole thing is, if you want to understand this in the combinatorial way, this is the grand, great language, right? Of course. But yeah, somehow, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's better. Sometimes it's better to withdraw and look it from the. So, uh, uh, for example, this um, attitude to to find the resolution mm -hmm. for the symmetric matrices. So we we had the picture more or less clearly understood pretty soon. But then to go through <coughs> in the end through all the combinatorics is really pretty messy. Okay. So. <coughs> okay. Okay. 
Good. Thank you, Eric. Uh, any uh, any other questions to Yersla? No. Okay. If no, let's thank uh, Yersla again. Thank you. Yeah. I'm glad. Yeah. Okay. So thank thank I you. Will do this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you, Yersla. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, thanks uh, everyone and. Uh, basically see everyone on on, uh, on uh, Thursday on the next uh, vaccine okay okay thank you bye bye, bye. thank you vanya see you later i hope bye bye, <laughs> bye, -bye.